recorded live from Hong Kong and Toronto. Toronto. This is the PR and Law Podcast. The PR and Law Podcast. Turn it up, turn it up. With your hosts, Cam McMurchy and you and Christy. That's right. Turn it up. This is episode number 24 of the PR and Law Podcast. I'm your host, Cam McMurchy, along with you and Christy. Hello, Cameron. Ewan's an employment lawyer and partner at Duntroon LLP in Toronto, Canada, and he's online at duntroon.law. I'm a PR guy based in Hong Kong and publisher of the Digital Bits PR and Communications newsletter at digitalbitspr.com. If you enjoy the podcast, please tell a friend, let them know that we are doing it each week. And you can follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook as well to get updates. And the account name is PR Law Podcast, all one word, PR Law Podcast. And you can also subscribe to us on YouTube, which I see our numbers growing on there, and SoundCloud as well. And you're welcome to ask us questions too uh, on social media with the hashtag PR Law Pod, and we will answer them in a future show. This was a insane week again, you and I feel like we say that a lot. Uh, how, how's it going yeah. from your side? Oh, well, well it's, it's, it's like it's all as if it hasn't always been COVID for the last however many months. But this week has been it's been a big COVID week here, Cam. We had our cases in Ontario are back up over 400. The government's imposing, you know, restrictions on social gatherings. Again, we had two federal political leaders test positive for COVID within, you know, a few hours. It's just uh, it's, it's just, it's, it's not, it's not a good scene. So are you doing? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, I, the company that I work for, I've mentioned on this, mentioned on this podcast a few times, Tencent. Uh, obviously we had an extremely busy week because, uh, it was announced in the U S that WeChat would be blocked in the United States. So obviously I was a part of figuring out what we're going to do uh, about that on the PR and communication side. Uh, But just before we were recording, and we do record this Sunday night, Sunday evening, Hong Kong time, but it's Sunday morning there in the East. um, We just received word that there's an injunction to temporarily uh, stay that ban. Uh, So WeChat is still available in the US. Um, It's one of those things I wish I could talk about more, but it's obviously very confidential inside the company. Uh, But it's, it's, I've had some very, very late uh, nights this week. But aside from that, you and I mean, there's all the stuff going on with TikTok, Uh, you know, COVID over here, we're talking about an 11 country bubble because the numbers have been so good for so long uh, that there may be travel between these countries without quarantine. So to me, that's a huge plus. And then, of course, maybe the biggest news of all, uh, the death of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Yeah, that was a that was a big thing, a big thing in, in, in our household. Actually, I woke up um, Saturday morning and, you know, this gave me some sense of hope. I I was doing a lot of reading on Ginsburg over, over the weekend cam, you know, I think we should link back to, I know we, we talked about Ginsburg in episode 16 and a, and a fantastic article that we, we shared profiling the, the other nine women in RBG's Harvard law school class, um, before she transferred over to Columbia Law School. Um, a really, really cool story talking about the demographics of women in law schools, which, you know, at the time was like 3%, 3% of lawyers in the country were women. And today they're 50. You know, RBG has played a huge role in that. Um, she was only the second woman to sit on the Supreme Court. And at one point she was the only woman on the Supreme Court Um, you know, it's, it's sort of, it's just difficult to, to try and, you know, use anything other than superlatives and hyperbolic descriptors, um, when, when talking about her, but, you know, I I wanted to say this when I woke up, uh, Saturday morning, um, I overheard my wife talking with our, you know, three and a half year old. And, you know, my wife, as I've spoken about before, Cam, she's an amazing mother. She's also a really, really accomplished lawyer and litigator. And she was speaking at length to our three and a half year old about why Ruth Bader Ginsburg (laughs) um, was important. You know, some of her accomplishments to which my daughter just kept replying, well, why and why? (laughs) That's good. That's a good question. But it gave me... That 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 gave me some sense of hope for the future and for for women and for women in law. Um, 
And you, yeah, that's sort of the, the positive that I'm trying to take away from all this. Yeah. The negative being this is six weeks before a presidential election. It's going to be already has been politicized. You know, you take a look at everything going on. And of course, recently, Donald Trump has been sort of sowing these seeds for, um, you know, a contested election. Uh, I believe Kaylee McEnany, his, his PR spokesperson, said that um, the system was designed for a winner to be announced on election night. Um, which isn't actually the case, uh, but there's, you know, already we've we've seen what's happened with the post office um, and we've seen the protests, the riots, the uh, fires on the on the Pacific Northwest in California. It's a really, really volatile time in the United States right now. And then with uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg passing away, kicking off a battle on the Supreme Court uh, just puts more fuel on that fire. Uh, so it's going to be it's going to be a very, very interesting next six weeks ahead of the election. Continue the debate with us on social media. Join us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at PR Law Podcast. All one word, P-R-L-A-W Podcast. Send us your questions now by email to askus at prlawpodcast.com. That's all one word, askus at prlawpodcast.com. Or on social media with the hashtag PR Law Pod. That's hashtag P-R-L-A-W-P-O-D. All right, you and I know you have something very important to talk about today. <laughs> well, I do. And it was I think this is very important and it got buried um, with everything else that was going on. It wasn't really something that was discussed or the people turned their minds to. And I and I think they should. And that is PACER, Cam. And PACER is an acronym for public access to court electronic records. OK, um, really exciting, right? Um, but PACER is the U.S. federal court system for accessing public documents, and it contains more than one billion documents filed at all federal courts. OK, now there has been some legislation that was introduced. It's the, called the Open Courts Act, and this is legislation to overhaul PACER. And there was a House Judiciary Committee on Tuesday that unanimously approved the Open Courts Act to overhaul PACER, guaranteeing free public access to ju judicial documents. Now, why is this a big deal, Cam? Well, it's a big deal because access to justice is a big deal. You know, we can't really have a, a really effective judicial system, be it in Canada or the U.S., if you have sort of pay for access to fundamental content and case law that anybody who's going before a court needs to have access to. And effectively what you're doing is you're creating a two tier justice system where, you know, the wealthy have access to the case law that they need to effectively argue their cases. Whereas, you know, self-representative plaintiffs, for example, who don't or can't afford legal counsel effectively don't have access to the law that they need to to forward their case or to defend themselves. So, you know, this is a really, really, really big thing. And again, um, I understand that often on this show, Cam, we don't talk about the most sexy of, <laughs> of legal topics. And I understand that this one might even be up there in the top of the pile, but it's a really, really important issue that people turn their minds to. Yeah. You know, this reminds me of something, and this is a very, very minor and small example of what you're talking about. But I don't know if you remember you and uh, I guess it was in the early 2000s, 2001, I think I had a car accident in Vancouver and it was my fault. I was turning left and I was hit at an intersection and I was hit by a car coming through the intersection. Uh, it was a green light for them. So it was, it was my fault, obviously. But the issue over insurance, I mean, the, 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 the insurance company argued that it was 100% my fault and that I would pay, my insurance company would pay. Um, but we wanted to challenge that. And I don't know if you remember this, but actually my mom, who is a legal assistant, sort of took the lead here. I was 20, 21 years old or something. Um, and went through a lot of case law on these kinds of accidents going back decades. Um, and through that access was able to put together a case without hiring a lawyer, without going somewhere else, 
um, a, a, a really compelling argument. And the verdict was changed uh, as a result of going through that material. So I, I think that's what you're talking about. Just this this stuff that's so important that people need access to um, in, a, in a way that's cost effective or in a way that they can afford. Well, yeah, Cam. I mean, you know, that old adage, knowledge is power, right? And that's really all that we're talking about. And sometimes we're not talking about, you know, the idea that lawyers operate in some sort of, you know, magical, magical world where they're, you know, they're, they're wizards and have these unique abilities that, that no one else has access to. It's completely, it's completely ridiculous. Now that's not to suggest that there aren't incredibly talented solicitors and barristers out there. Obviously there are, and the law can be incredibly complex sometimes. And that's why, you know, the, the bulk of the legal world is divided into areas of specialization for, for good reason. But at the same time, you know, a good case can be a magic bullet for you. You know, that's why access to the law, Mm -hmm. to the actual judicial decisions is so critical to the success of anybody who walks into a courtroom for absolutely anything. And, you know, let's put this in context, Cam, particularly in, in the age of the internet, right? You, You talked about your car. Let's say that, you know, after that accident, you decided that you couldn't afford to take your car to a, to a body shop or, to fix something that had gone wrong on it. And you wanted to try and fix it yourself. Well, you could go onto YouTube. You could probably find a video that is specific to your, you know, your make and model of your vehicle. And within a couple of hours, learn how to, you know, perform that particular task yourself. Now, does that mean you're going to do it as well as a mechanic? Well, probably not, but you definitely not in my case, access to that information and an ability to do it. Well, in, in, in the case of, of, of access to case law, that's not always the case, right? That you have to pay for access. Imagine having to pay for access to that YouTube video that you want to look at or any other information that you want to look at on the internet. Um, and of all things that should not be paywalled, Judicial precedent, decisions of the courts, these are not things that should be, you know, guarded under lock and key and only accessible to those who can afford it. Yeah, definitely not in free societies, too. I mean, I can understand that uh, being the case in, in mainland China, for instance, where the legal system is a little bit different um, than it is. But but for Canada and the U.S. and other sort of Western democracies, it seems like, I mean, the legal system is, is transparent uh, or should be transparent. It's open. People can go to trials in many cases. Um, it's meant to be public so the public can see the wheels of justice turning and see how it works at every step of the way. And that's really to keep people informed and ensure that the system does work and that it is held to account uh, as well. So this is this is a, a big part of that. Um, I, I, you and I have to ask, like, if, if, if people don't have access to this PACER uh, that you mentioned in the U.S. or something similar in Canada, I mean, are there any workarounds? Are there ways that people can at least get bits of information that might help? them out. Well, I mean, anybody can can access, as I understand, um, cases on PACER. It's just that you have to pay money for it. And that's the thing, right? And I mean, a lot of decisions, as any lawyer will tell you, can be very long and convoluted. So if you're doing legal research on a particular topic for your matter that's going before court, the likelihood that you're only going to have to look at one case is slim to nil. You're probably going to have to look at several cases. So if you're having to pull four and five, six, ten, however many decisions, and they're all 30 or 40 pages each, I mean, the costs can rack up really, really quickly. Um, And this is why, you know, lawyers in any context typically have access to really, really sophisticated legal databases that are fantastic research tools that can really drill down on specific keywords or terms to make sure that counsel can find the case that they need. So, you know, we're, we're, we're just talking about a basic entry level here, Cam. We're talking about trying to give free access to people to find the cases. We're not even talking about a complex search algorithm like what most lawyers have access to so you know we we almost have to learn to walk before we can learn to run now here here in canada um we have a system we have what's called canly the canadian legal information institute and it's done a pretty good job um providing free public access to decisions at all levels of the courts in in all provinces um really again nationwide still Sorry, it's nationwide. 
Yeah. Now, but I mean, even then, it still leaves a lot to be desired. There are a lot of decisions that aren't reported on Canly. So if you're looking for a specific case and it's not there, well, good luck to you. Um, You know, more likely than not, you're either going to have to try and write to a specific court um, to get a to get a print copy sent to you somehow, or you're going to have to pay to have access to one of the legal database sources that most lawyers have access to. And again, you know, you're sort of creating almost a two tier system where, you know, lawyers just they just have a huge, huge advantage over any self-represented plaintiff that's going to go before court, not just because of, you know, a particular legal expertise and training, but just in terms of access to information. Now, you know, I'm not saying that we're going to create a level playing field where, you know, um, Joe Public, who walks into a court, is necessarily going to have the kind of expertise to to compete with a senior seasoned litigator. But that individual should, at the very least, have access to the same information that that lawyer has access to. I mean, that should be the very fund. I mean, this seems like a fundamental principle um, of litigation and and of the courts at at, at a base level. All right, I don't want to go down too much of this path but um why why don't they like why is pacer set up or why why is it set up this way where it is a a charge or pay service great great question great question um i mean again i think part of this is just reflective of the legal industry being very 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 slow (laughs) at, at adapting to change at um creating digital and online databases. Um, this is, I, I could, I could speak ad nauseum about this cam about all kinds of examples of how, you know, the legal profession continues to operate in, in, in the stone age. I think we're getting better. I think COVID has really, really helped in that regard because it's, it's sort of forced the industry to get digital and get online in a way, um, that it wasn't before, you know, we've talked about, hearings and mediations and examinations for discovery taking place over Zoom or or WebEx or some digital platform as opposed to physically taking place in in person. So I, I think I think we're getting there, but we still have a, a long way to go on this. Show your support to the PR and Law Podcast by making a one-time donation or setting up a subscription with us on Patreon. Every little bit helps us keep the lights on and bring the show to you each week. If you'd like to chip in, please visit PRNLawPodcast.com. That's PRNLawPodcast.com. Click support the show. Thanks for helping us out. All right. So, uh, you know, in the PR uh, item this week, I do want to talk a little bit about an issue that's come up in China a few times, but it's not only in China. Um, and it's sort of about how brands are being canceled. And we talked about cancel culture, you and I know already. Um, but in this case, uh, it's pertain, it pertains to the brand Joe Malone, which uh, is a British men's sort of cologne brand. And I think they do a few other things as well. Um, it's, it's very well known. It's available uh, worldwide. I'm not sure if you heard of the story this week, Ewan. Um, but no. Joe. John, no, I, I actually, I don't even know if I know who Joe or John Malone okay. is. Joe Malone, it's a brand. <laughs> anyway, John Boyega, a black actor famous from Star Wars. Uh, he is the brand ambassador for Joe Malone. Now, as a result of that partnership, he naturally appears in ads and commercials that are shared globally, except in China, where he was, what is called here, whitewashed out of the ad. And many believe it's because he was black, and oftentimes China doesn't respond well uh, to black people in advertisements. I want to get the story right now. This is from Monocle 24 Radio. So John Boyega, um, the Star Wars uh, Disney actor, brought on as the first male ambassador for this perfume brand, uh, Joe Malone, very well-known global perfume uh, brand. And, and of course, that's a whole technique that brands use. They bring on these ambassadors in order to drive uh, customers uh, towards them, that sort of aspirational sense. Well, uh, Boyega uh, launched a perfume uh, with uh, Joe Malone, became their first male ambassador, and yet he suddenly finds that in the Chinese version of the ads, he's been airbrushed out of the entire concept. Uh, He's furious. He's resigned as uh, a Joe 
Joe Malone ambassador because he said they didn't talk to him or consult him in any way. So, you know, once again, you know, using an ambassador to promote your brand may be a great idea, but if you're not going to use them, you probably better tell them. Ewan, we ran the Nanfang years ago. I think we've mentioned that on the show before, too. I don't know if you remember the laundry detergent ad um, that also sort of went viral in China. Do you recall that one? I do vaguely. Yes. So in the ad, and I will put a link to this um, in the show notes, it basically had, well, it did have uh, a black man with a Chinese woman in the laundry room. The black man looked like he was trying to kind of get it on. She pushed his head into the, into the washing machine and then his full body into the washing machine. And lo and behold, when the cycle was done, it was a very white or light skinned Chinese person who came out. Um, that actually ran for months in China without any kind of complaint or noise until a foreigner saw it on TV and posted about it on social media. Naturally, that went around the world. Uh, Huffington Post called it the most racist TV commercial ever made. Dove did something similar uh, just in 2017. So, th- I mean, this has happened uh, a lot of times and how, how do you think we go about fixing this, Ewan, based on your own experience sort of in China and dealing with this kind of thing? Well, yeah, great question. Um, but wait a minute. Isn't, this is not the first time, if, if memory serves, that this has happened specifically to John Boyega in China. Wasn't there a whole controversy around the Star Wars poster, the Force Awakens poster in China, where his character was either removed or dramatically shrunk from from the Chinese poster. I, I'm, I'm fairly certain, I guess I can quickly pop on the internet while we're doing this to confirm that that was the case. But Correct. I, I believe that this isn't even the first time that this has happened to him, right? It's not. It did happen in 2015, uh, the Star Wars China poster. Yeah, it shrunk him down. So if you take a look at the poster that was used globally, um, he's got he's quite prominent. He's not the most prominent in the poster. But in China, he's shrunken down to be non-existent, basically. I'll put a link to this as well. So yes, you're right. This, this individual person has been hit twice by this. And I think it, it does bring up a, a, a bigger question. Um, and this is tough to, to talk about in China a lot, but it is, I think it's fair to say, a very racist country, by and large. I'm not saying everyone there is racist, but I think racism is really tolerated to a degree that would quite shock people elsewhere. I don't think China is alone in that. I think there's other Asian countries like Korea and Japan, who, uh, which are often in, in a similar situation. And the one thing these countries all have in common is it's very uh, homogeneous in terms of the ethnicity of the people who live there. So if you look at China, I mean, 99% are Han Chinese, the same ethnicity. So it's, it's very clear... Um, it's not as diverse as Europe or as the US or Canada, these kind of places where we sort of accept people from different places. In China, I mean, even if you're able to get a uh, Chinese green card, if you tell people that you're Chinese, people are going to look at you funny if you have a white face, even though legally you might be Chinese in terms of nationality. Um, so, so the whole concept of race is a lot different in China. Yeah, I mean, this is this has clearly been a longstanding issue and it's going to continue to be a problem going forward as, you know, you you have more sort of brand inter- integration from um, from North America, from Europe, making inroads into China. Uh, I, I don't I don't know how how they they, they tackle this one. Um, I mean, I think John Boyega did did the right thing and sort of saying, well, this is look, this is ridiculous. You didn't even consult with me. Um, I'm I'm out. It's obviously terrible for the brand. I mean, what's the, the brand's reaction been to this, Cam? Well, they've been very embarrassed by it, obviously. Um, and I mean, they went ahead and did this without actually telling him that they were going to do it. And I think that was the big draw. I mean, I do want to go through a couple of things here. Brands should, should keep in mind sort of in these, in these sorts of situations. Um, but, but I, before I do that, I want to mention a dynamic in China that's different than in the U S or Canada. And it's that, especially in the U.S. where race is a very divisive or a hot topic um, all the time. I mean, it's a country that's sort of grappling with its history this way. But there's a lot of sort of even among the the white community or the establishment looking inward saying, how can we be better? Like we have to do better. I mean, we see a lot of this, right? So 
that dynamic is fine. But when you go to China, if you're a foreigner talking about how Chinese should be more tolerant of other other people, that's different because that's an outsider telling you how you your society should function. And obviously that is not not taken well. I mean, I don't think we would take it well either if people from 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 South Korea came to, to Canada and said, this is how you should be, you know, managing these social issues. So I think that dynamic's quite difficult because it means that it's hard to come in and say, like, this is a wrong thing to do, even though it is a wrong thing to do. Uh, because oftentimes in China, they say, yeah, but it's it's accepted. It's fine. And who are we to say as outsiders that they should change? Yet they should change. <laughs> Yet we should tell them. Uh, so it puts it puts us in a very difficult situation. Yeah, I mean, this is we're sort of coming bumping head head first into issues of cultural relativism, right? right. I mean, uh, that's where I'm who, going. Who, who is any country to sort of say how yeah. another country should conduct themselves in terms of their their racial and, and ethnic politics. It's a very, it's, it's a, it's a difficult issue to tackle. You know, I lived in the city of Guangzhou for a year. Um, people might know that name. It, it was called Canton previously. It's where Cantonese came from Cantonese food. Uh, it's now Guangzhou. But um, you know, when I was there, Guangzhou is known as chocolate city in China. That's how it's referred to because it has a huge African population there. Um, it's the one city in China that that is really unique in that way. And of course, there's benefits. I mean, there's excellent food and restaurants there as a result. Um, Amen to that. Yeah, but it's it's they do face a lot of discrimination, a lot. And even most recently, uh, earlier in 2020, uh, there were a lot of uh, black residents of Guangzhou who were kicked out of their apartments by landlords. McDonald's was not serving black people for a time in Guangzhou. I mean, this is an American company uh, because it was they were concerned that they had COVID-19. So, I mean, this is a perennial problem in China. But what should brands do? And, I, you know, it is weird, Ewan, because the one thing I've kind of learned over the years is never assume that people know what they're doing. <laughs> like, I feel like right. things right. like this should be avoidable. I don't really get it. Like, obviously, this was signed off on, you know, on by somebody somewhere. And there wasn't enough, of, you know, or verification or, or sign off on the decision by people higher because it got through right to air. So, I mean, a couple of these things are quite obvious. If you're doing a global ad, do research in all the markets where it's going to run. I mean, to me, this is really, I don't even think this needs to be said or it shouldn't need to be said. Um, but I think there is some hubris sometimes, uh, you know, among ad execs or among people in certain countries where, you know, they think it's a fantastic ad. They're going to share it. And there's just not much thought about how some of these things are perceived in different countries. I'm, I'm sorry, but this seems to be a pretty common problem. Um, you know, you, you sort of almost stated like it's it is incredibly obvious that, you know, ad execs should have some sense and some awareness as to what advertising is going on with their brands around the world. And yet um, it seems like every other month there is some company that is busted for some terrible ad of their product somewhere around the world. Um, and then, they, you know, the press goes to comment from 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 head office and, and and the response is almost or invariably oh well we had no idea or we didn't approve it or we had outsourced that particular campaign to a third party in that country there always seems to be some sort of explanation that doesn't actually address the fact that no 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 you never should have posted this ad in the first place to me it's it's just unforgivable because even a cursory search would would bring up these other cases that have happened right i mean I, this is just not rocket science at all. Um, but I think um, the key the key issue here that brands have to reckon with is if Chinese audiences do not respond well to black people in really key or important positions or as the face of a movie franchise or whatever it might be, should they proceed without putting a black person there or should they put one there in order to try and change attitudes? And that's ultimately what it boils down to for the company, because I would understand. I mean, you look at, um, I, I guess, in, in, in PR, like in communications and what I do in particular, you're, you're trying to manage risk all the time and lower it to the lowest level feasible. Um, you want to make sure that you know, you've looked at things carefully and there's not much to pick at here. Uh, 
So I can see in that case why, um, you know, Disney, for instance, on the Star Wars poster would would say, okay, like we're, we're going to make him smaller here. This is just the market reality in that market. And whether we like it or not from a Western perspective, that's the reality there. So this, I feel like, is a very difficult decision for brands to, to wrestle with. Yeah, well, and this, it, it all, it, this sort of seems like we're getting into, you know, Benjamin Barber's, you know, Jihad versus McWorld kind of territory here, right? I mean, who who's going to be making these decisions and who should be making these decisions as well? Are we going to have some, you know, white ad exec sitting in his office in Manhattan, making a determination as to what a poster is going to look like in Beijing for their particular product. I mean, that seems kind of ludicrous as well. And, you know, the idea that a global brand is just going to have one particular model or one particular campaign style that's going to be applicable in every market around the world that just doesn't strike me as particularly practical. I mean, you, you talked about McDonald's cam and I mean, you know, um, as, as I recall, if you look at a menu in Beijing, when you walk into a McDonald's and compare it to something you're going to find in, in Texas, for example, sure. You're going to have sort of those staple menu items, but then you're going to have a number of things that are tailored to the particular marketplace and what's popular and what the preferences are of that, of that individual market. So it's not like large companies, companies are, are, are completely tone deaf with regard to this. But it seems as though, at least with regard to advertising campaigns, that they need to sort of get to the next level of, well, what, what are we dealing with on the ground here? And what are we dealing with from a cultural perspective? perspective on the ground vis-a-vis our brand and how do we address that and how do we come to the realization that perhaps the approach or how it's going to be interpreted might be a little bit different than uh how how consumers interpret it in our own backyards absolutely and you mentioned the um mcdonald's menu if you walk in in beijing you know yes obviously i mean we can get um cups of corn in Hong Kong from McDonald's, you know, things like that. And um, they do adjust the menu to local taste and nobody complains. So if, if you're a Western person, you walk into a McDonald's in Hong Kong or, or China, um, you're, you're not going to complain that there are local items on that menu. The menu has been adjusted slightly to, to appeal to local tastes. So we accept it, obviously, when it's something like a food item. But is it OK if it's a person, a race? I mean, this is where it gets really dicey. Um, and I, and there's not an easy answer here because on the one hand, I think, you know, absolutely you shouldn't be downplaying a black person in a poster because the society is racist, but at the same time, your goal is to get people to watch this movie. Like that's, that's, what's going to pay for your shoes. Like that's, that's the key point here. And you just don't want to fight this battle. Like I do see in the ad execs office, you know, thinking this is not a battle we want to fight. This is just a reality. Let's just go up, go ahead with it. Yeah. I, I mean, I, th- I think you're right, but I also think that that's precisely the thing that consumers end up finding or, or deeming to be so abhorrent, right? The idea that a, a corporation is effectively just kowtowing in the, in the, in in that regard. I mean, we we saw what happened recently with with Mulan, <laughs> the whole the whole rollout um, in terms of issues with 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 comments that were made by one mm-hmm. of its stars vis a vis protests in in Hong Kong and um, Disney effectively remaining silent on on the issue. I mean, I think that's where when you when you sort of when push comes to shove in that regard, you want your brand to sort of stand up. Um, but the brand is left in a very precarious position in terms of how does it do that? And to your point, um, protect the product that it's in, in, in business to sell. Absolutely. Here's what Joe Malone, they did issue a statement, uh, after, after, uh, John Boyega had resigned as brand ambassador. Here's their statement. We deeply apologize for what, on our end, was a mistake in the local execution of the John Boyega campaign. John is a tremendous artist with great personal vision and direction. The concept for the film was based on John's personal experiences and should not have been replicated. While we immediately took action and removed the local version of the campaign, we recognized that this was painful and that offense was caused. We respect John and support our partners and fans globally. We are taking this misstep very seriously, and we're working together as a brand to do better moving forward. Effective? 
better than better than most of the uh, statements that you've read on the show cam mm-hmm. from other uh, other companies that have found themselves in similar positions um look I, again what, what what always sort of rubs me the wrong way with with a lot of these statements is they're trying to be all things to all people and and i i just don't know how you can realistically do that i mean i guess that's the challenge i guess that's your job um but that's kind of how it reads to me i actually think it's it's not a bad uh, apology to be honest i mean i think they could put a little more in there about how they intend to do better i think we talked about that on a previous show as well when these apologies happen like don't just say you're going to do better say how you're going to do better what's going to be different what changes are you going to make to make sure that this doesn't happen again and um i mean that that part is missed i think uh from 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 the apology um but it is the next point on my list here which is when you end up in a situation like this as a company as a brand obviously the ad has to be pulled immediately immediately like as fast as you hear about this you're on the phone to get that thing pulled and then there should be a a a public apology which um you know joe malone got that part right (laughs) if it could have applied its sort of uh pr expertise earlier in the process they might have avoided the the uh the situation altogether but uh unfortunately they did not um i i did want to bring up another item just because while we're talking um about statements so um so this week you know we talked off the top ewan uh about the app bans in the united states so the you know the president uh, president trump uh signed two executive orders to to ban tiktok and wechat uh, and the two companies obviously responded, but I want to talk about TikToks. Um, I declared my my conflict of interest right off the top that I work at Tencent, which owns WeChat, but I do want to focus on TikTok in this case uh, because I think they've got quite an interesting statement uh, that they put out, and it's they took an interesting tack. So here is what TikTok said, and remember, this was issued hours after Donald Trump came out and said, actually it was Wilbur Ross, the Commerce Secretary, uh, on Friday came out and said that these two apps would be banned. I'm not going to read the whole statement uh, because it's a little bit long, but I want to focus on um, a couple of items here. So, quote, we are shocked by the recent executive order, which was issued without any due process For nearly a year, we have sought to engage with the U.S. government in good faith to provide a constructive solution to the concerns that have been expressed. What we encountered instead was that the administration paid no attention to facts, dictated terms of an agreement without going through standard legal processes, and tried to insert itself into negotiations between private businesses. Hmm. They came out swinging. Clearly. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. I, I actually, I, you know what, though? I, I like it. Um, I look, I, I, I like it. I think it's a, I think it's a good statement. And I think it, part of why or the reason I believe it's a good statement is because they're appealing to and it's those last few lines, Cam, where they're appealing to free market capitalism. They're saying, hey, guys, I thought you guys are supposed to be the purveyors of laissez-faire economics here. And if that's the case, what are you doing being so interventionist in this regard? Um, And I think that that it's smart in terms of trying to attract support um, when you know your goose is effectively cooked anyway. Um, I, I, I like it. I think it's a good statement. It goes on, quote, there has been and continues to be no due process or adherence to the law. The text of the decision makes it plain that there has been a reliance on unnamed reports with no citations, fears that the app may be used for misinformation campaigns with no substantiation of such fears, and concerns about the collection of data that is industry standard for thousands of mobile apps around the world. We have made clear that TikTok has never shared user data with the Chinese government, nor censored content at its request. In fact, we make our moderation guidelines and algorithm source code available in our transparency center, and we have expressed our willingness to pursue a full sale of the U.S. business to an American company. It does go on to talk about uh, business um, optimism in the United States. Quote, this executive order risks undermining global businesses trust in the United States's commitment to the rule of law, which has served as a magnet for investment and spurred decades of American economic growth. And it sets a dangerous precedent for the concept of free expression and open markets. Yes, it is. Uh, it did come out quite strong. And when I saw this, um, 
I do find it refreshing. Um, I mean, clearly, and if, if we really stand back and think about this, TikTok has been, uh, has been sort of picked on now for over a year. Um, over these concerns or theoretically concerns over, over their use of or how they manage data, but there has been no evidence that they have done anything wrong. Um, so I understand why they're frustrated, but the question you have to ask yourself though, really as a PR person is if you need the government support, if you need the president to sign off on some solution that keeps your business open, this is a very risky way to do that because you're going after them hard and then you're going to have to turn around and try and beg for their approval, which did happen. I mean, obviously it did. It was breaking news over the weekend that the president has signed off on, on an arrangement with Oracle. Um, but it's a very risky way to, to go about that. But it, I mean, could it also just be that they know who they're dealing with cam and that they know that, um, you know, to meet, to meet might with anything other than might is effectively just going to leave them worse off than they were before. Uh, that's possible. And there is one, I did see one, one comment on Twitter because obviously Tencent, we, we also put out a statement uh, after this. Ours was much shorter and to the point, I don't have the copy of it here. I'd read it, but someone on Twitter did say, this is the difference between a company in TikTok's case that is fighting for its survival I mean, it, 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 to, to, I mean, that's its primary product is, is TikTok and the U S is its biggest market. Um, so, so it needs like, it's, it's desperate in a way. I think that Tencent wasn't, um, we don't, Tencent doesn't have much business in the United States at all beyond video games. Um, and so the, the impact to the company is, is much less than it would be on, on TikTok. So I think this, the, the person on Twitter had stated that this came across in the two statements cause they were quite different in terms of their, their approach. Um, but I do think that, that, um, We'll never know, I don't think, what happened really behind the scenes with TikTok uh, and the U.S. government. But it is clear that the president did insert himself into it and that Larry Ellison, the the chief executive of Oracle, ends up with something like a 20 percent stake in TikTok. And again, he's close with the president, has held fundraisers for the president. So this certainly if there was no corruption here or nothing sort of out of the ordinary, it sure looks like there was. And that's really damaging, I think, to businesses in general. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Check this out. Whoa, hey, check this out. No, no, wait, wait. Check it out, check it out. I want you to check this out. On the PR and Law Podcast. Okay, you and I know you're well read and you listen to a lot of podcasts and you're a very smart erudite guy. So what do you have for a recommended item this week? Well, that, you know, that's really, really the, the, the wrong preface for what I'm going to talk about. Here, Cam, <laughs> oh, no. Because what we're talking about is very, very serious stuff here. Very, very serious stuff. Enya, Cam. Enya. Enya? You mean en- the Enya? Oh, I mean the Enya. <laughs> the only Enya. Uh, I read I read a fantastic article, Cam, this week, um, titled Enya is Everywhere. Uh, this is a pitchfork article. It was written by Jen Pelly, and she's arguing that it's time to take Enya more seriously, Cam. Really? I didn't um, even know Enya was still around. But okay. Oh, and you're still around. Yeah, she's she's still around doing her doing her thing. Now, you know, look, Cam, admittedly, I have never been a fan of Enya's music. In fact, I, I, I think it would be fair to say that I've <laughs> made a conscious effort to avoid Enya's music. Uh, but this article, it makes a pretty compelling case that perhaps I've been unfair to Enya uh, all of these How years. How so? Well, Pelly, she really backs her argument up. She she first of all, she brings in a small army of contemporary artists that I really, really like and listen to vouching for for Enya's street cred and influence on contemporary pop and R&B and hip hop. Um, she she interviews Grimes and Ways Blood, FKA Twigs, Angel Olsen, Perfume Genius, just to name uh, name but a few. And, you know, I didn't. I didn't know much about Enya's backstory and I have to say it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. She's entirely self-made. She wrote virtually all of her own lyrics and music from the get go, um, as well as performing all of her own instrumentation. She started recording at only 18, um, released her debut record in 87 and get this. She's sold cam over 80 million records. Wow. Yeah. No small million. 
Um, and, you know, so, so part of the, part of the argument here, and this is the part that, that sort of really struck me as, as interesting as to why Enya was sort of given such a bad rap. And you can remember, I'm sure Cam, all the sort of bad new age jokes. I mean, I think even, even South Park did a bit on, on Enya just sort of mocking her music and mocking all of the really terrible, awful new age music that sort of followed Mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in her wake. But, you know, part of what Pelly argues is that what was going on with any at the time and part of why she got such a bad rap was really more reflective of, you know, the patriarchy of the music industry at the time in the late eighties and how difficult it was for women to secure record deals at the time. And that when she was initially signed, you know, nobody really knew how to sort of market Enya. And she herself has talked about how she was really reluctant to sort of give in to the labels who wanted to try and rebrand her and give her a more, you know, quote unquote, sexy and accessible look. And she effectively said, no, I'm not doing any of that. I'm just going to continue to do my thing. I'm not bringing in, you know, top notch producers to try and alter my sound. She really really stuck to her guns and did her own thing and um listening to some of the contemporary artists talk about her in that regard um is really interesting so you know i i I don't think my uh my appreciation for for enya is going to (laughs) change dramatically cam but i will say that this article has at least sort of uh given me a, a kick in the ass to go back and perhaps review some of her back catalog. Well, you know what? Interestingly. So I am, I've never been a huge fan of the beastie boys. Um, I mean, obviously their music has been around as I was growing up. So, I mean, I was right in the age group and obviously I know a lot of, a lot of, a lot of beastie boys songs and things like that. Um, but, but this week I, I did something similar and that I finally watched the beastie boys documentary, which is on Apple TV plus, And it's not, I don't know if you've seen it, um, but it's actually about the two remaining members uh, because obviously Adam Yau died in 2012 of cancer and he was sort of the, uh, the main guy. Uh, but it's sort of a, a stage production. Spike Jones put it together uh, and the two remaining guys sort of take the stage in a theater in New York City and they talk through these key moments in their lives with obviously video footage and photos and, and some narration and things like that. So it's, it's a, it's a, interesting way to do a documentary, but it was also quite powerful. And it did like with you with Enya. Um, it gave me a bit more appreciation of the BC boys knowing their background. I mean, I never didn't like them. I just wasn't hugely attracted to them, but hearing their story and how it ended kind of tragically with, with the death of Adam Yauk was quite, it was quite powerful and it was very well done. Yeah. I mean, I remember reading about it when it came out, I, I didn't get around to to watching it perhaps i should see so you think it's you think it's a it's a good watch it's oh, worth my absolutely time. absolutely i think it's a great watch i highly recommend it and again i'm not a beastie boys fan um and i really enjoyed it that isn't even what i was going to talk about today though um the the but i'm glad you mentioned the enya thing because that reminds me of the beastie boys thing uh the one thing i want to talk about you and how familiar are you with QAnon? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm I, about, about as familiar as I want to be. Well, okay. So, um, I've heard bits and pieces. I kind of know a little bit about this conspiracy theory that has taken hold in the United States, but, uh, in short, uh, it does believe that there's sort of a global cabal of celebrities and the Clintons and others who are trafficking children, uh, and, and eating them, eating babies. This is, this is what they actually believe. Anyway, um, I had more light shone on it and I understand it much more now. Thanks to a podcast called recode media. It's one I listen to all the time because it focuses on the media industry, like streaming networks, you know, newspapers and, and portals and whatever. Uh, but they did have an NBC reporter on this week to talk about the QAnon phenomenon. And he finally broke it down, like what it includes, why it's, um, you know, become such a problem. Um, and it's a, it's a fascinating discussion. So I'm going to put a, a link to the show notes to that, because if you're you're wondering what this is once and for all want to figure out, you know, what are people talking about and what do they believe? This is sort of like the QAnon 101. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a good listen. Oh, perfect. That sounds great because yeah, that's part of, that's part of the problem, right? You start to dig in and the disparity of, of sort of news investigative reports, <laughs> QAnon, they're pretty, it's pretty broad. Um, so it's a tough thing to kind of, to kind of dig into. 
Yeah. And it's, it's, it's depressing. I mean, when you listen to this and you feel there's millions of people that believe this, it's not a small number, uh, and it's cost lives already. So it's, it's, it's serious as ridiculous. It sounds, it's, it's a serious problem. Um, the only other thing I just want to mention, just because I just saw it pop up, there's an article in, uh, New York magazine, the cut, uh, you mentioned the cut for something a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this one is called buying myself back and it's written by Emily Ratajkowski. I don't know if you remember that name. She is a very well-known model. She appeared in the blurred lines video. Um, she's written this piece just about photos of herself and trying to get them back and she doesn't own them and how difficult that is when you don't control your own likeness. Uh, and it's quite a, it's quite a, personal kind of essay. Um, again, this is another subject I probably wouldn't have read about normally, but I got into it. And then once I was into it, I read the entire thing and I thought it was, uh, again, it's another way of looking sort of at the system now in the United States, uh, just over sort of things like IP and, 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 and copyright. Yeah. Well, and why people need to retain good counsel to review their contracts before they sign them. Right. Yes. Um, we also saw something about this with regard to, to Kanye West releasing his contracts, um, saying, I don't control my masters. I don't control my masters. Well, you know, I mean, ultimately you signed an agreement that signed over the rights to your content for X number of years. Presumably you were not under any particular duress when you executed that agreement. Presumably you were given the opportunity to, um, to get independent legal advice. In fact, I would go so far as to argue that the contract itself probably states that you were, were granted that opportunity. So, you know, to kind of turn around after the fact and, uh, and say, Hey, you know, um, I didn't want to sign this. It's not a particularly compelling argument and frankly could get you into a lot of trouble for, for breach of confidentiality um, and a lot of the other covenants that are presumably within, within those contracts. So yeah, this is, this is definitely a big thing and I, and I, and I can appreciate it. It must be really, really difficult as an artist or a celebrity um, with that level of success, um, be it either Kanye's or, or, um, Emily Rad- is it Radadowski? Is that Radikowski, you yeah. I think it's yeah. Radikowski pronounced. Yeah, um, it's it's got to be it's got to be tough, particularly when you're starting out, right? And I mean, there's just such an inequality in in bargaining power when you're trying to negotiate the terms of these agreements, and you have no 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 power to to negotiate them. Um, you know, and I I don't know what we can do to sort of address that. I mean, that's sort of an age old. Um, issue of disparity between, uh, between, you know, employer and employee or, or anything that you contract for. But, um, yeah, I mean, this happened agreements, people. Yeah. This happened, uh, earlier this year. I think it was this year with Taylor Swift as well. Uh, somebody that she is in a dispute with ended up buying a lot of her back catalog. So, um, yeah, this is something, it's not just Emily Ratajkowski, but it's, uh, I think she shines a good light on it and it's affecting a lot of different artists, uh, now. Okay, you want anything else you want to chime in on before we uh, sign off? Yeah, I mean, just just very very quickly, Cam. We should, um, you know, we we should mention the death of John Turner, the former Canadian yes. Prime Minister, seventeenth Prime Minister of Canada. Um, he just died at the age of of ninety one. Um, I yeah, was a so uh, just- John Turner fan, and I'm talking when I was really young and didn't really know anything. <laughs> But I remember liking him. So uh, I don't know. I was five or six or seven or I don't know. I was very young at the time. But for some reason, I did uh, appreciate him. So that's very sad news. Yeah. I mean, he, you know, he, for, for those history nerds, right? I mean, he had the second shortest tenure. He was only prime minister for 79 days, right? He effectively came to power, um, dissolved parliament for an election and then lost in a landslide to, to Brian Mulroney. But um, he had a long career in politics, uh, but before becoming prime minister. So he's yeah. second shortest Kim Campbell. Where does she fit in there? Uh, <laughs> good. Well, Kim Campbell's not the shortest. I think, I think the shortest was actually, uh, Charles, Charles Tupper. I don't know how many days, Jeez, I don't know that name. I'm pretty sure that Tupper Tupper was the shortest. So, oh, okay. Um, I, I, I mean, maybe Kim Campbell's <laughs> I third, I guess. I maybe guess. we have yeah, one listener who knows what we're talking about. <laughs> we're going we into definitely the only one yeah. <laughs> who can raise on the uh you know the uh, 10 years of canadian prime ministers i suspect that would be listening to this show yeah 1980s canadian prime minister trivia good times 
Um, okay, thanks, Ewan, for that. That's, that's, I'm glad you mentioned it. It is sad. Anyway, on that note, we are going to wrap this up. So thank you again so much for joining us. Don't miss a show either. Please subscribe in your podcast app of choice, or you can subscribe to us on YouTube and SoundCloud. Uh, also, follow us on social media. We're across all the major platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, and the account name is PR Law Podcast. That's all one word, PR Law Podcast podcast. And don't forget questions. We, we're still getting a few coming in. Um, we definitely want to set aside some time in a future episode to to address some of these questions. We're even talking about maybe even opening up the phone lines uh, if we get to that point. So I think that could be quite useful. So you, you can ask the question on social media. Just tag it with the hashtag PRLawPod and we will log that and answer in a future show. So for you and Christy, this is Cam McMurchy. Light it up. This has been the PR and Law Podcast with Cam McMurchie and Ewan Christie. If you enjoyed the show, please share it with a friend or leave a review. You can also join us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook by following our account at PR Law Podcast. That's all one word, P-R-L-A-W Podcast. Thanks for your support.